Welcome to AstroCast.TV, your source for news and information about astronomy and our solar system. Now, here are your hosts, NASA JPL Solar System Ambassadors, Greg Redfern and Greg People. Hi everyone, welcome to episode two of AstroCast.TV. I'm Greg Redfern. And I'm Greg People, and you know I'm really excited about today's show. You'll be talking about the Solar Dynamics Observatory. Yes, the sun's weather and how it can affect our daily lives. And I'll be visiting Saturn and some of its moons courtesy of the NASA ESA Cassini-Huygens mission. That's right, Greg. And AstroCast science advisor Dr. Harold Geller will be answering some of your email questions. And from the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C., we'll be talking to Katie Moore who will give us a night sky update for the month of May. But first, on to SDO. It's the launch of the Solar Dynamics Observatory, or SDO for short. Think about it. Right in our backyard sits the sun, a colossal nuclear fireball spinning its way quietly through solar minimum. But in the next few years, magnetic storms on the sun called active regions will begin to pick up and that's where the excitement begins. Solar flares and huge ejections of charged particles called coronal mass ejections or CMEs can threaten satellites, disrupt radio transmissions such as cellular telephones or the internet or even cause power outages here on Earth. What we need is an early warning system for the sun, and that's where SDO comes in. Scheduled for launch in December 2008 from Cape Canaveral, Florida, the SDO will carry an array of instruments to help scientists understand changes in the sun's magnetic activity and help us better predict its effect on Earth and human technological systems. It will investigate the disturbances deep within the sun, how that energy builds up, and how it's ultimately released towards the Earth. By monitoring density waves, similar to sound waves inside the sun's interior, SDO will map out the strength and direction of magnetic fields and what leads to those powerful eruptions. All thanks to the Solar Dynamics Observatory. Now let's not forget the other solar satellites in orbit. For example, Hinode, which means sunrise in Japanese, has started its three-year mission to explore the sun's magnetic fields and to improve our understandings of the mechanisms that power the solar atmosphere. By exploring the physics of the sun, Hinode will examine some long-standing solar mysteries such as the solar wind that blasts through the solar system and buffets our atmosphere and may cause disturbances to our communication systems. So perhaps in the not too distant future, we'll be checking our space weather just as often as we check our Earth weather. All thanks to the solar satellites like the Solar Dynamics Observatory and Hinode. Seems like our weather people are going to be busy in the future. Indeed they are. Saturn has been described as a jewel of the solar system and with good reason. One look through even the most modest of telescopes will reveal the majestic ring system and Titan, the largest moon of Saturn. The rings are simply spectacular, as you can see in this video taken with my 10-inch telescope. The shimmering you see is caused by turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere. Four NASA spacecraft have been sent to explore Saturn. Pioneer 11 was the first space probe to fly by in Saturn in 1979, followed by Voyagers 1 and 2 in 1980 and 1981. The Cassini spacecraft is the first to explore the Saturn system and rings and moons from orbit. Launched October 15, 1997, Cassini entered orbit on June 30, 2004. The European Space Agency's Huygens probe made a two-hour parachute-assisted descent into Titan's thick atmosphere with its camera and instruments clicking away on January 14, 2005. On the surface of Titan, the Huygens probe collected additional data and photos for one hour and 12 minutes and became the farthest man-made object to land on another world. The data it sent back revealed a world thought by many to resemble Earth billions of years ago and continues to be analyzed. One of the most intriguing Cassini discoveries about Titan is that it has hundreds of times more hydrocarbons than all the known oil and natural gas reserves on Earth. Some hydrocarbons may precipitate from the sky, collecting in vast deposits that form features similar to lakes, seas, and dunes that can be seen with Cassini's radar. The dark dunes you are seeing now run along the equator and contain organic or carbon-bearing material several hundred times larger in volume than Earth's coal reserves. Now we've got the perfect segue from the Cassini mission to Saturn. Katie Moore from the National Air and Space Museum is here to tell us what's up for the month of May and that includes Saturn. Take it away Katie. Thanks Greg. With all this talk about 
about Cassini and Saturn, I thought I would start off right away by telling people where they might find Saturn in the night sky. The planet Saturn is well placed for evening observing this May. Look for it high overhead as darkness falls. You will see two bright light sources close together in the sky. The one closer to the east is Saturn, shining with its soft white glow. Even with a small telescope, you can see Saturn's rings circling the planet. The rings are appearing to get thinner as we approach a ring plane crossing in 2009 when they will all but vanish from sight. After that date, the rings will steadily appear to grow wider as Saturn's pole tilts back toward our planet. The star next to Saturn is Regulus, the brightest star in the constellation of Leo, the lion. Find a backwards question mark and a triangle. The semicircle represents the lion's mane. The star at the far end of the triangle is named Denebola, which translates from Arabic to mean the lion's tail. On May 12, the first quarter moon joins Saturn and Regulus to form a close gathering of bright celestial lights, all within about three degrees of one another. Astronomers everywhere will be bringing astronomy to the people on Astronomy Day, Saturday, the 10th of May. You can find out about Astronomy Day events near you from the Astronomical League's website, astroleague.org. Now back to Greg Redfern and Greg Keepel. Thanks, Katie. We're all looking forward to the events on Astronomy Day this 10th of May. There'll be a great warm-up for the next year's International Year of Astronomy called IYA for short a worldwide event designed to help citizens of the world rediscover their place in the universe through the day and nighttime sky and thereby engage a personal sense of wonder and discovery. More on the IYA in episodes to come. Now it's my pleasure to introduce you all to the brains behind AstroCast.tv and that is Dr. Harold Geller, director of the George Mason University Herschel Observatory in Fairfax, Virginia. He's here to answer some of your email questions. Dr. Geller. Thank you, Craig, and welcome to George Mason University's observatory here on our Fairfax campus. I'm going to answer some of the questions that were received here at astrocast.tv. Norma from El Paso wrote, I like your program, even though I don't know that much about astronomy. I was wondering if you could explain dark matter in the universe, and why do they say that the universe is 96% dark matter? Well, Norma, of all the matter that exists in the universe, it is estimated that the so-called dark matter makes up about 96% of the matter. The remainder is ordinary matter, similar to that matter that makes up you and me. The types of dark matter include massive compact halo objects, comically called machos, weakly interacting massive particles, comically known as wimps, and neutrinos. All components of dark matter have one thing in common, and that is they do not shine like stars. They are not luminous. That's why it's called dark matter. It should be noted that the entire universe is currently believed to consist actually of 74% dark energy and the remaining 26% is all kinds of matter that exists. Now, from early here, are the planets in our solar system close in age? Which is the oldest and which is the youngest? And why can't the space shuttle fly if it's cloudy? Well, Earl, as scientists understand it, formation of the solar system took place about 4.56 billion years ago, and that includes the sun and all the planets, including dwarf planets, too. With respect to the space shuttle and clouds, I would like to point out that not all clouds are alike. The space shuttle actually can fly if it's cloudy. However, NASA is mandated for safety considerations that mostly clear skies are required for launches. That way they can film the underbelly of the space shuttle as it launches. It's also important for the landings. Unlike powered aircraft, the shuttle actually is a glider and only gets one chance to land. That's it from our observatory here at George Mason University. Now back to you, Greg. That's all the time we have for this episode. Be sure to see our next episode in June as Greg and I head up to look at the latest and greatest at the Northeast Astronomy Forum Expo. Thanks for watching and join us as we learn more about the wonders and mysteries of the universe in which we live and explore.